thank you all. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'll just jump right into it. Okay. Uh, so real quick, uh, kind of why I'm doing this research. Um, and then an overview of some of, not all of, uh, the depth estimation methods. Um, and then I want to talk about reduction to the pole uh, a little bit, which I think will play a big part in all of this. Um, and then looking at the one specific technique I'm using, which is with multi-height, um, so survey at multiple heights, um, and then where I see this going moving forward. Um, all right, so I think to some degree uh, the technique maybe has reached kind of a plateau. Um, we, we go out and we survey and people are, you know, they draw their lines and we interpret these features, uh, but a lot of times we're not really moving forward with a quantitative analysis of the data. We just interpret uh, this is a wall, this is a pit, okay, let's go dig it up. Um, what are we going to do moving forward from that? Uh, additionally, I think we see a lot of people coming at this from the archaeology side. Um, they're not physicists originally, and so maybe some of the higher kind of processing techniques might not be applicable to them. And how do we take that information and get it to a lot of other users? Uh, and I think this kind of this idea in how we're doing this in geophysics in general kind of be explained in a little anecdote. Um, Basically, so I have my master's, started working at the University of Arkansas, and I'm taking a class with my advisor, and I write a paper about how GPR is better than magnetometry because I can get depth information from it. And he politely informed me that I was wrong, uh, that you can get depth information from magnetometry, but it's not something that we really do often in archaeology, but it's something they do quite often in geology. So. I think that's kind of the impetus behind why I'm trying to research this. It's kind of his idea, but moving forward with that, and also connecting the 10 or 20 years or so of research that's occurred in the geology side of things that maybe the archaeologists haven't kept up with. Right. Uh, like I said, uh, depth estimation kind of appears overlooked um, in archaeology. Uh, there's some papers, 60s, 70s, 80s, and then it kind of peters out and kind of resurgence in, in the 90s to some degree, but this isn't something that we really do often. This isn't in most people's workflows. So there's multi-height uh, and gradient methods. I'll talk about the classic half-width rule, uh, Euler deconvolution, um, and that's ma the main stuff that I'll be talking about. You could go a little further into dipole fitting, inversion, other analytical methods, uh, and the center of magnetism estimation. And most of these kind of hover at a plus or minus 20% accuracy. Uh, so the chart here, if we look at something that's a meter, a meter in the ground, um, we might estimate the depth to be 75 centimeters, a meter, 25 centimeters. Uh, and, and those are your kind of error bounds, but I think we can do a little better than that. And so with multi-height techniques, uh, we're going to take two differential measurements. And so I think I should preface all of this with some of these methods may have to be adjusted or the instrumentation may have to be adjusted and maybe we should move away from using the flux gate gradiometer and move into total field sensors or other sensors. Um, and so this kind of just basic rule here, I think most people would be familiar with this, our magnetic force, our magnetic anomaly um, equals the magnetic moment, volume divided by our distance. Um, and then N is a structural index to fall off rate. And so the only thing, the only application I've seen uh, with this is by Weymouth in 68 or something. Um, and so he takes two, two measurements at two different heights, and we can algebraically solve then for depth. Well, that's a, that's a mess up. That's supposed to be 1 over N, my apologies. Uh, and so we, we can use this to basically cancel out the magnetic moment and the volume, which are very difficult to estimate or determine. We have the classic half-width rule, probably the best known, um, based on the same theory. And uh, you can perform it on contour data or gridded data. Um, and a lot of people's synthetic tests show that this kind of has about a 20% error, but still I don't think a lot of people use this currently. Uh, and with gradient data or gradiometer data, there can be a debate about those two things. Um, it's going to underestimate uh, the depth. And, yeah. okay. 
the gradient method um, is, again, uh, it's kind of all tied to the same theory where we're taking a uh, differential measurement over a gradient. Um, you can use just your gradiometer output as the gradient, or you can do um, some transformations to turn this into a true gradient. The accuracies are about the same, and I'd prefer the easier just using the measurement. Um, and it's had limited application in archaeology and environmental things, mainly for looking at steel drums. Um, and, and for this particular thing, it assumes you're directly above the source. Uh, we lead into Euler deconvolution. Um, and so uh, this is commonly used with vertical gradients, and then uh, you derive the horizontal gradients. Um, it's very fast application in the computer. Uh, some of the older techniques uh, would estimate a structural index or a falloff rate. Uh, there's potential pitfalls to this, and a, not as, it's not as commonly used now. Um, but basically, you, you would set up some kind of least squares fitting to estimate your structural index and then also to estimate the depth uh, to whatever you're dealing with. Um, and there earlier debates would suggest that you need to do reduction to the pole before this. Later things show that maybe not so much. Um, that's a different debate. And one thing is that um, it doesn't really take a geologic assumption. So you just kind of throw the stuff in. And whenever it was estimating a structural index, this would all be accounted for. OK. So uh, one thing that I can see, uh, sorry, these couple things didn't show up on this one. Um, but basically, it's all related theories. Um, so the half width rule is based off of this. And so Weymouth's method, um, if you're just directly over top of, all right, we can cancel down to here. Also, the gradient method um, related to Euler deconvolution, um, it's the same thing where x and y would be 0. We can cancel out the left half of that stuff. And now we're just dealing with the z component. Um, so part of this, I think, is problematic in what instruments we're using. Um, like Bartington, you're just going to get that gradient measurement. They're not giving you the top and bottom sensors. Um, and I think moving forward, that can be very useful for what I'm proposing to do and other types of techniques for higher data processing. So uh, reduction to the pole. It's kind of cut off down there. Um, basically, this accounts for inclination and declination. Uh, it's originally designed for total field data using a Fourier transform, and, but that didn't really perform well in low latitudes. So then moving forward, they use inversion methods to fix this increased computation. But at this point, I don't think that's really an issue with modern computers. And basically what we're doing is we're taking whatever the anomaly is and centering it over, where it's, uh, over top uh, the center. Um, it can be affected by remnants. And I think reduction to the pole doesn't really see much use. I think that's partly because we're collecting data at high latitudes, so it doesn't look that much different. But as people move forward and we see more surveys in low magnetic latitudes, it can be more useful. Um, and so basically, you know, we have a dipolar feature, um, and we're going to reduce that. Now we've just got a positive. Uh, all right. Um, OK. So uh, originally designed for total field, but you can perform reduction of the pole on a vertical gradient. Um, to et al. Uh, published part of this. Um, and it's, they note that, and I think this is just kind of noting from the literature, that this can be a problem at low latitudes. I think I will show in a minute that it's not. Um, and so we take the Fourier transform. Uh, we do a multiplication in the spectral domain. We spit it back out. And now we've got our. Uh, reduced data. Also, they suggest two analytical moduli, or total gradient amplitude is a more current term. Um, and so these aren't necessarily as affected by remnant magnetism. And so that's that these guys here, and that's cut out. But that's the square root uh, for those. Um, and I'm not going to really, I just wanted to bring those up for completeness, but I'm not looking at those today, but potentially in the future. Um, and for a lot of what I've been doing, it's all modeling. Uh, I have done some field tests, uh, but I'm using Fatiando Atera, uh, which is an open source Python library uh, to build your magnetic models, um, among other things, and let you kind of compute the total field or any component measurements. 
Um, and so they implement a reduction to the pull technique uh, by Blakely. Um, it's very similar, but slightly, slightly different. Um, and they also have the total gradient amplitude in there. Um, and so first, I wanted to compare these two different reduction to the pull techniques. And hopefully, I don't know how well this shows up on here. It's nice on the screen. Um, so this is at 65 degrees inclination. Everything's at 10 degrees declination. And so this is the total field anomaly, the reduction to the pole, and then what it would look like perfectly at the pole. And for everything, all the models that I've done, I've added just kind of standard Gaussian noise to everything. Um, and so then here is our, our vertical component, and then the reduction to the pole performed by these two different methods. Um, uh, moving down, so if we apply this at 30 degrees inclination, we see the total field data looks a lot worse. It's a lot more. It's a lot harder to interpret. Whereas the vertical component looks a little more like what what it should. Um, but still, now we've got a dipolar feature. And we reduce it to the pole, and this is what it would look like uh, at the pole, the original field. And so now, if I if I bring it down to one degree inclination, um, the total field does get messed up, right? It, it breaks down and it, it no longer works. And this occurs, you can start to see artifacts um, around 15 to 20 degrees. It starts to mess some things up. Uh, but with just the vertical component, I don't see any of that artifact or those problems. So it appears that it works. I'm curious as to why. I haven't dove into that as much, but I'm going to. Um, and so this is just for a spherical body, uh, just examples. Same things, and this is a model of a wall. Um, and again, so this is our reduction, and that's what it's supposed to look like. And at one degree, the total field fails, but uh, for the vertical component, it's still OK. And so just evaluating these really quick. Um, so right here, th what I did is the mean, uh, which are the solid lines. Uh, that's for over the entire grid. Um, and then the max, which is the dotted, I just extracted the max value of each feature and looked at those differences. For the depth estimations, I was looking at just the max values, so that was of greater interest to me. And we have about less than one nanotesla difference um, after performing the reduction of the pole um, from what it should be on any of the data. No. And that is accounted for with the sphericals. Um, and then this is for the wall. But either way, we see pretty good results. Um, okay, so then I implemented Weymouth's multi-height technique. Um, and I think it's in general good agreement um, between the depth estimation and the true value. So what you're looking at here is the difference um, between the true and the estimated center depths uh, of the spherical body. Um, this is the percent error. I'm sorry, those are cut off on the bottom. Um, and then this one on the left uh, is a plot of the estimated center depth and the actual center depth. So a pretty straight line. Um, as many of you will probably notice, uh, this red line gets pretty wonky there. Um, and what that is is, so I just iterated um, different radius, radii of the spheres at different magnetic strengths and stuff um, throughout the depths. And what we get here is these measurements, the, the measurements are like 0.01 nanotesla. So you wouldn't actually see this um, in the real data. This is just kind of, I just included it because um, it's the whole thing, the graph, but this, this sensor is 0.01 nanotesla, so it kind of gets crazy. Um, all right. Uh, so then uh, perform the same thing with uh, the wall data. Uh, not as good, it's not as consistent. It's kind of crazy, and these graphs are a little hard to make out. Um, <clears throat> but one thing that I think can be pointed out um, is in these, we have the top of the source, and then the dotted line is the bottom of the source. And so we consistently, at least within the top meter and a half, are estimating the bottom of whatever the feature is, not to the center. Um, so the estimations are still generally within whatever anomaly source body it is, and then kind of tail off around two meters. Um, the reason for that, I think, is the basically we're using the wrong structural index or the wrong falloff rate. Uh, for walls, theoretically, it should be a structural index of two. 
Um, whenever then I calculated the magnetic moment and everything and plugged all it in um, for this particular model, it should be 1.7. That would give me the right answer. Um, so in conclusion, um, I think the Z component RTP uh, reaction to the pole performs well at all latitudes and something that can be used just within of itself, um, looking at dipolar anomalies, basically if they're, and additionally if you're dealing with remnant magnetism, it'll mess up the reduction to the pole. And so if you're trying to determine whether or not a feature has remnants, um, you can perform the reduction to the pole and then evaluate. Um, also can just kind of ease interpretation in general. It's not often used, but I think it could be. Um, I think the multi-height depth estimation performs pretty well for spherical bodies. Um, not so good uh, for the wall, but we are estimating um, at the bottom of that particular feature. And moving forward, I'm going to continue tests on various uh, geometric models, increase uh, the noise to see how this might work in a more realistic environment. Also, I'm kind of apologize, I didn't get it all worked out, so I didn't want to present it here um, today, but uh, estimating the fall off rate. And so I was setting up a system of nonlinear equations to then estimate n in depth. Um, and so that's kind of still in the, in the middle stages. Um, and then uh, moving forward, perform these at controlled test sites. We have a couple in the US. I know of a couple in Europe, but I'll be performing them in the US um, at some real world sites and develop a GUI and for the RTP and the depth estimation. And I want to thank my advisor, uh, Dr. Kavame, because this was all his idea. Uh, uh, Dylan Young, a friend of mine um, who double checked on my math. And Dr. Taba for correspondence through email, a little bit of help. And questions, comments, or concerns? And yes, that is a beer. Thank you.